Well, on behalf of Pam McMillan and myself, Jenny Cruz Williams, I just want to welcome you to what is the South African launch of novelist and so much more than that, Kate Moss, and her latest book, The City of Tears. And let me just show you the cover while I can. I mean, <laughs> look at that drop dead cover, look at it. And if you go closer to this cover, when you buy your copy, you'll see that there's a map underneath it. And I don't know whether that's Paris or Chartres or Amsterdam, actually. Amsterdam. It's Amsterdam, Amsterdam. which is the City of Tears, obviously. City of Tears. So, so it, this is part of the Burning Chambers series, and it's an absolute winner. Now, I, I want to tell you just a little bit about Kate before we really, really begin. She is, I mean, she is a novelist par excellence. I, I, if I look at the books that she has actually written, the plays that she has written, the non-fiction that she has written, I know I can't repeat all of it. You're going to have to look it up for yourselves. Um, you've got the OBE. Uh, you had various art councils, uh, Chichester, the theatre. I mean, you are busy, Kate. I don't know how you... I don't I'm know old. how you... I'm old. <laughs> well, well, you don't look old. You look absolutely brilliant. You actually started the legendary Orange Prize for women's fiction. And now that's the Bailey's Prize, of course, uh, for women's fiction. What, what started you off doing it? I, I know that you're an activist, but what was the, the moment that made you do it? Well, that, that's a great place to start. And, it, and it's now actually the Women's Prize for Fiction. We've gone back to our original um, name. You know, what is this prize? That's what it is, Prize for Writing by Women. And it was, I mean, we're 25 years old now, Jenny. And I started it, started to think about it, you know, several years before that, you know. Um, so it's, it's kind of mind-blowing, really, that we're still here and growing. But the idea was really straightforward, that we should be... Uh, celebrating women's writing and respecting it and honoring it at the same level that we honored writing by white men. So there was always this thing that literature with a capital L, you know, was written by George Bernard Shaw and, you know, all, all of the men that we can think about. But almost everybody else was kind of left out of that. Um, and of course, it's not only women, it's absolutely uh, black people, people of color, people with different sort of cultural heritage. But for me, my, I'm a feminist and a campaigner in that area for women's rights. And what we noticed was that there was no problem with women getting published, white women getting published, at least in the UK and in um, other countries, you know, America and so forth. But there was a real problem with women ever making it to prize shortlists. And literary prizes matter because they keep work of quality on the shelves. Otherwise, a book is on the shelf, it might be there for only six weeks and then it's gone. And the idea that anybody can find anything we all know isn't true. It's the drip drip effect. So we decided that we would set up a positive, celebratory, um, joyous annual prize for international writing by women. So wherever she was in the world, if she was writing in English, she was eligible. Um, to make sure that women's voices and women's stories were at the heart of the book world, not seen as peripheral to it. And the stats were really shocking. So some 60% of novels published then, back this was back in the you know, early 1990s when I was doing my research, were authored by women, but fewer than 9% of books ever shortlisted for major literary prizes were by women. <laughs> so it was about honouring women's work. You were busy writing, Kate, and, um, and I was doing a little bit of research before I last interviewed you, which was <laughs> Ranshuk. Yeah. And little no, but I, I'm very curious to know when you got the idea of friendship, when that kept into, because I think you were there for almost two years running, or have I got that mixed up? No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. But in fact, the inspiration for th this whole series, you know, I'll hold mine up because my copy's only just arrived here, actually. Um, and it's a glorious orange colour to brighten up these dark winter days in England. So you, you, you came to Franschuk originally in 2011. That's right. I was there. I was invited to a book festival. I can't even remember which of my books I was promoting. And I'd never been there before. I'd been to Cape Town a couple of times, uh, but had never been into the Winelands or in, in, into Franschhoek. And as I was being driven to the town, we passed a green sign at the side of the road that said Longadoc. Now that, as any of my readers will know, is the name of the region about which I write in France. And it, I was like, what is this sign doing there? It's spelt with a Q, but there it was. And then coming in that lovely long road, 
that comes through sort of Breckenstein into Franschhoek, I started to notice that the wineries we were passing all had French names, you know, Grand Provence, Petit Provence. And that surprised me because I, I didn't know the history of the area. And then we get, of course, into Franschhoek, and the first word you see is Huguenot, you know, Huguenot Street, Huguenot Road. And when I had a, a spare moment, I went to the museum at the end of the road, um, Main mm -hmm. Street in Franschhoek, went in, was very, made very welcome. I'd done, I was doing that thing that authors do on tour, Jenny, that I, you become helpless because you're looked after so brilliantly. I have brilliant South African publisher and they look after me fantastically. And so I went in and I tried to pay with a credit card and they said, well, we don't take cards. Um, and I said, oh God, I haven't got any money with me. And then they looked at me, they peered at me and they said, are you an author? And I said, yes, I'm just in town for a couple of days for the book festival. And then they said, well, you can come in for free. And it was a, an act of such generosity that has changed the course of my writing life. So I went in and I started to read the history of a handful of French refugees, Huguenots, who had fled persecution in France in 1688 and had come to the Cape. And they were there because the governor of the Cape at the time had realized that the land uh, in, the, you know, the, in, in the Western Cape was similar to the land in Languedoc in France, and therefore thought maybe we could import some people who could make wine. And there was a South African wine industry then, but it was very, very, very tiny. And they sent word back to Amsterdam and seven families accepted the invitation to sail to the other side of the world. And this just blew my mind as a piece of history. And then I went to the room at the back of the Huguenot Museum and there is a beautiful board with all the names of those first Huguenots, some 150, 60 of them, that are written on the board. And there on that board, Jenny, was the name of a family that I had written about in my 2005 novel, Labyrinth. And at that moment, I thought, oh no, there, there's a story for me here. And then I thought, don't do it, Kate. You don't know anything about the Reformation, 16th, 17th century Europe and France. You know nothing about the further you know, the, the more ancient history of South Africa, only the more modern history. This is not your story. But then I went into the graveyard that many people listening will have visited um, by the Huguenot Museum. And I walked up and down and saw all of those French names on the tombstones, the Dutrois, the De Villiers, the Jourdains, the Joubert's. And then I looked up at the mountains and the mountains, the Franchuk mountains that ring the town which I've now been lucky enough to see because I've made friends um, there and people have taken me into those mountains. They look very like the mountains of Languedoc, of Ariège. And at that moment, I suddenly had this, oh, I know how to tell this story, that it will be 300 years. It will be about the Huguenot diaspora. It will be about what it means to leave your home and travel to the other side of the world. But unlike a lot of stories, it will be a story of hope. Because I stood in that graveyard, I thought, if you looked up at these mountains and you'd grown up hearing your mother and grandmother and great grandmother going all the way back to 1562 when the wars of religion in France started, talking about the home they'd been forced to leave behind. And then you found yourself in Franschhoek and you felt this sense of, oh, I could belong here. I could find a new home that will give me and my family everything I want and literally that's where it started and then of course I had years and years and years and years of research and I had to go back to the beginning of the wars of religion but it's why I have the prologue in Franschhoek in book one and book two and at the end of book three we will be arriving in the Cape and going to Paul and Dreckenstein and Stellenbosch and Franschhoek and book four will all be set in your part of the world that I wish I was with you now um, because it is an amazing story, amazing story. And I'm, you can see I'm still in love with it, still in love with it. <laughs> you know, I think novelists are detectives and we're archaeologists and we walk around the modern place trying to see the layers of the old city beneath our feet. And it's a great pleasure to me to, to re research Carcassonne in all of this um, period of time. The thing that was the, not a challenge with the City of Tears, that is although my lead characters carry Carcassonne in their hearts. Carcassonne itself doesn't appear in the City of Tears. It's the first piece of historical fiction where I have taken my people away from my inspiration, if you like, 
because of, that is an enormous part of what it means to be telling the story of the Huguenot diaspora, of course, is that they carry Carcasson um, in their hearts, but it is lost to them because of the religious civil war that is going on. And that's been quite interesting because normally I have everything I need about, you know, at my fingertips about Carcassonne. Whereas this time, of course, I was focusing on Paris first, Chartres, which I know well anyway, but mostly then Amsterdam. And when I come to books three and four, it will be my tiny beginning love affair, firstly with the Canary Island, which features in book three, but then getting to know uh, the Cape. Um, and that is a very different and exciting prospect because it's a very completely different sort of land, a completely different sort of history. But I remain convinced that what makes a great adventure story is that combination of mystery, history, and landscape. And as long as you can capture that, your characters have got somewhere brilliant to play out their stories. When I read The Burning Chambers, I was riveted um, because it does, it, 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 I mean, it begins in Carcassonne and um, two characters, you've got, um, you've got Minou and you've got Pete and, um, and he's lovely and they meet and fall in love and whatever. And then they, they, they part, they don't see each other. And suddenly we're in Toulouse. And I was thinking, no, but why Toulouse? I mean, Toulouse is just a big sprawling modern city. And then there is this indescribable massacre in, in Toulouse and the terror um, of the people there because they didn't know what was happening, but they knew that their lives uh, were at stake. And that was my first introduction to the, these absolutely desperate religious wars. I know about St. Bartholomew's Eve. I think many people do. I had no concept of the scale of this war. I think millions of people must have died. They did. In the course of the wars of religion in France, which went from 1562 to 1594, um, millions of people were tortured, killed, obviously slaughtered, sent into exile, were lost. Um, it, was, it was an act of self-harm, really. Because as we all know, Religious war is never about faith. It's always about power. It's about uh, ascendancy. It's about beating the other guy. And although it was about a power battle at court between two sets of Catholics and one set of Protestants, which is what, you know, the Huguenots are simply is the particular name for French Protestants. Um, and it was essentially that a tiny number of people, but that power struggle essentially dragged the entire country into a, you're either on this side or that side. And when I start the burning chambers, I felt it was really important to make the point that, and I still believe this, you know, despite everything we see on our television screens, that most people want to live in harmony with their neighbors. Uh, that it's easy for people to be whipped up. It's easy for people to be demonized, to be told that you, if you're not against those people, you're against us. We see it all the time. This is the story of history. But it was very clear to me when I was researching that Mina, when she goes to work on that first morning in the burning chambers, she goes to her father's bookshop. She is a Catholic girl. She says hello to her Jewish neighbors, to her Protestant neighbors, to her Catholic neighbors. They just all are Carcassonne. They just all live in Carcassonne. But hundreds of miles away, a massacre is about to happen in a place called Vassy in Northern France. Uh, perpetrated by the Guise family who are at the heart of all of this and that will change the course of history for everybody and I was really interested in that because I write stories with women at the heart of them I write stories about the unheard and untold stories of women from history because sometimes when you look at the 16th century you would be forgiven for thinking the only women that existed were queens and princesses and the mistresses of generals whereas I you know I'm interested in the story of all of us the people who are affected by the decisions made in our name and often who have no power over them. And that is very important to me. So all of these things, it was you know, a shock to me to realize how early the violence started. Like you, the one thing I knew was the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre and to discover that there had been many massacres before that and after the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre, which is a key moment in the city of tears, 
there were copycat massacres throughout France in which, just in the next few days, in which 70,000 people died. So, so our hero and our heroine, for want of a better word, um, they flee, uh, they, well, they don't flee, they leave, uh, they leave um, a place near Carcassonne, Prouvaire, um, where they are living um, very happily, and they go to um, Paris, and they go to Paris for a wedding, which is, actually sounds wonderful. But the, the journey, there, there are sinister moments along that journey with people saying, well, are you, are you Huguenot or are you um, Catholic? So, so the whole time there is this buildup of, of tension until you get to Paris. Now you, you make us understand and know Paris and, mm -hmm. and some of the little narrow streets and uh, and what actually happened in Paris and Bartholom St. Bartholomew's Eve. God knows how many people were killed there, but it was horrific. And then somehow or other, we end up in Amsterdam. And I can't explain all of it to everybody, <laughs> but Amsterdam wasn't a place that you were, uh, that you knew backwards as you do with Chartres and as you do with Carcassonne, etc. So how difficult was that side of, of the book for you to write? I've always felt that there might be a story for me set in Amsterdam, but I, I believe very strongly in waiting for the story to find you. I'm not someone who would ever say, oh, I like Amsterdam, therefore I'm going to make up a story there. I wonder what that story will be. For me, it's always about waiting for the story to find me rather than me seeking it out. And of course, this suddenly was the moment when I came back from Franschhoek in 2011. I was then you know, on a, a book tour in Amsterdam and I went then to the museum in Amsterdam just to do a little bit of research into this Huguenot history, the links between South Africa and Amsterdam. So it's a, there's a map at the beginning of the book and it is Amsterdam. And that is very important because when you realize how confined people were and how extraordinary it was to find yourself in a city in language you didn't speak at all. Um, Minu's husband, Piet is, is part Dutch and he has some Dutch, but Minu doesn't. Um, and to arrive in a place that tiny, that confined, how much you would stand out and how visible and vulnerable you might feel and it was you know a, it was a great gift for me to have that time and I came back feeling yes I I feel I have got under the skin of Amsterdam and it's really interesting because for me I mean this is a story it's a thriller it's an adventure thriller. it rips along that that's the point that to tell the story of Mino and her family and the her enemies and all of this but within the research it is an extraordinary thing that when Amsterdam, after 40 years of Catholic rule, turned, was handed over into the hands of the Protestants in one day in Amsterdam in, in, in May, not a single person was killed. And in the bloody history of the 16th century, it is an extraordinary thing that somehow they achieved enormous change with no loss of life. I just want to talk about characters because we're making it sound really quite fun, but you've got such a sinister figure in this book. We first of all meet in Carcassonne, and he is a cardinal, and, um, and he's beautifully spoken, and he wears very fine clothes and whatever, but he is so sinister. He's very still because he's watching you and he's listening, and he is not missing anything, and he becomes more sinister when you see him in the burning chambers and then in the city of tears and i dare say his legacy is mm. going to is going to continue into the third and fourth uh, fourth novels mm. where where did he come from well he's he, he's a character called vidal and back in their youth he and piet are at a catholic seminary essentially together and piet kind of because um falls out of love and hates the corruption of the Catholic Church and he turns towards Huguenotism and Vidal rises higher and higher in the church and he is absolutely a character study of what happens when power goes to your head where the reason that should be for becoming a priest which is to serve the God you believe in uh, becomes secondary to your own ambition and uh, desire for wealth and influence and power and uh, this is a, you know, the whole series of books. It is, as I said, a Romeo and Juliet story, you know, between a Catholic family and a Protestant family, essentially. And Vidal 
in the City of Tears, I wanted to take him further than I'd taken him in the Burning Chambers and ask a question that was at the heart of what was being debated between the Catholics and the Protestants. Um, and one of those things was the role of relics. Now, anybody who's listening to this who is a Catholic or knows Catholics will know that relics are very important in the Catholic faith. And they are, they could be anything. They could be the finger bone of a saint. They could be, of course, famously the Turin Shroud. They could be the Black Madonna. They could be the Crown of Thorns, which appears in the City of Tears. Uh, all of these things that have been touched or close to a saint or indeed Jesus or Mary or and, and it was an enormous industry and I wanted to challenge the idea that the object itself contained something that mattered and put into Vidal's mind the idea that well if the people believe that it's the authentic object then maybe it will still have the same effect so Vidal is slowly you know, we, I don't say what's wrong with him, but he has characteristics that would be um, appropriate if he had something like syphilis or any of these things, mm -hmm. a sort of dropping of his mental abilities and a sort of delusional state towards the end. But he is a very, very dangerous man and he is keeping up his feud with my family, as it were, right, you know, all the way through this novel. This City of Tears in the end is a lost child book. It has the same characteristics as a thriller about a child going missing. And that was not the book I was expecting to write, but all the research that goes around it. Um, I learned so much. Um, and I love, I love putting those things on the page, provided they're only on the page as exciting parts of a story. The minute the reader thinks, oh, she's done a lot of research, as a novelist, you failed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it needs to be seamless. <laughs> Well, I, 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 it is seamless. And, and Kate, as we come to the end of this interview, because this could go on as you <laughs> must be for a couple of hours, I'm looking at the prologue um, for The City of Tears. And the date here is Franschuk, the 28th of February, 1862. And you did this with the previous book, by the way, yep. of The Burning Papers. There was Franschuk at the beginning. And it starts off here. The woman is lying beneath a white sheet in a white room dreaming of color. Here rust, here lies. She's no longer in the graveyard, is she? And it starts there. And you just know that what we've been speaking about was the, the, the prologue or the prelude, obviously, to Franschuk. And, uh, and here I'm going to end off in Chartres with the um, coronation of the king and who, who um, manages to get rid of as many Huguenots as possible, because Paris was worth the mess. And worth the mess. Exactly. So, and it ends uh, with Manu, who now is a little bit older, and she looks back to her daughter, then at her granddaughter, who is tracing patterns in the dust with the toe of her shoe. And she realized something that you need to know as you buy the next book of, <laughs> of Tears. <laughs> you are very clever. <laughs> And I said, that's a clue. I know it's a clue, but I don't know where it goes. But, but Kate, what a pleasure it's been talking to you. And I know that your book is just, the, the book clubs are just going to eat it alive uh, because, because these books are so wonderful. So thank you very, very much indeed. Well, thank you, Jenny. And it's such a pleasure to share, you know, to, to launch the book in South Africa with you. Um, I wish I could be there, but I have been incredibly touched by the support from readers in South Africa and all the people who've been writing to me and telling me stories of their Huguenot ancestry. Um, ever since I've been to Friendship a couple of years ago, uh, and to promote the burning chambers, which you will remember, ironically, given the nature of the City of Tears, I was there with you guys in Franschhoek in 2018. And what were we watching on the television? A royal wedding. <laughs> well, there we go. Kate Moss, thank you so much. Thank you.